Thank you, Lord, for the time that we get to meet together and uh, to study how to explain what we believe. Uh, we pray now, Lord, that your spirit be upon us uh, to convince us <clears throat> that what we know from your word is true. And you, Jesus, you are the truth. And, um, and you are life. And so, Lord, we pray that you teach us how best to answer our critics and those of our atheistic and secularistic friends. Um, we pray for tonight that um, you open our hearts. Help me, Lord, to be clear about what I'm saying. And I pray that um, these brothers and sisters will be able to understand what I'm saying. In Jesus' name, amen. Also, good evening. Welcome. Um, I hope you had a good day. Uh, six o'clock <laughs> seems to be really quick, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but is everyone okay? Meleana is joining us, Mahafu. Yeah. Meleana C. So that's fantastic. Hi, that's great. Meleana. Meleana uh, and uh, welcome to Linda as well. Um, good to see you all. And I can see that Benny is also here. So, how did you go from last week till this week? Uh, did you? I mean, I, I've been wondering whether uh, the stuff that we did last week was of any help. But did you think it was okay, Josh? Yeah, I thought it was good. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah, <laughs> enjoyed it. Yeah. All right. Good. Um, yeah, I think um, I'm also learning. Right. I'm also because this is not an area where I mean I know how to answer some of the stuff. And I know what the Bible is saying, but uh, this is a great opportunity for me then to put together some of my thoughts and uh, some of the stuff that I know about answering to critics and um, into a kind of a coherent system so that we can, you know, it helps us to think, uh, especially when we come face to face with some of these critics, some of these skeptics um, or atheistic friends. Um, so let me, uh, let me share screen. As usual, um, you can always stop me. You can always um, ask me a question. See through the chat over on the other side there. Um, but our lecture is um, going to be recorded, or it's already recording. Um, and it will be made available to you, to you all to listen to it. I myself, I went back to listen to myself just to see whether I make sense to myself. So, um, yeah, so I will do that as well. So, I mean, it's also just to hear what I've been saying and try to build up on that. Because usually when you, uh, if you have an atheistic friend, the, the argument seems to be going round in circles, right? It's usually the same kind of question, but they word it in a different way. And, and then sometimes they caught us out, out unprepared but the, but we well, we do know the question to almost all the all the answers says, and I will try to help you also tonight. So tonight we will be looking at. Um, let me share my screen. Um, ways of doing apologetics. Right? So the various ways of doing apologetics. Am I sharing this? Uh, my screen or not? No. Do you see my screen? It's not showing up yet, but it's not showing up. Okay, let me try again. Okay. Is that does it show up? Is it do you see that? Okay, wonderful. Wonderful. Welcome to those who just joined us. So uh, various ways of doing apologetics. So um, three things I want to do tonight. Firstly, I want to look at that the different ways of answering our critics. These are the ways that uh, Christian theologians and ministers through the ages, through the history of the church, um, these are the ways they have used, um, or these are the approaches they have chosen in order to do apologetics, in order to explain why we believe what we believe. But also after that, I want to look at um, um, the, the reason why uh, the, the atheistic, uh, skeptic, 
secularist worldview does not make sense, right? I think we are living in a world where the atheistic worldview is prevailing, is dominant, is the main worldview. But from time to time, because we come into the ideas from a Christian perspective, we get um, absorbed without um, thinking critically about where they're coming from. And I will use uh, Black Lives Matter as an example. There, right? um, and then lastly, um, I want to do I want to say something about what the Bible says about the atheist. We should also look into the, the way the atheists think uh, and, 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 and speak um, from a biblical um, point of view as well. So anyway, various ways of doing apologetics. So the first way is the way of the evidential, right? the evidentialist. They, these are the people who um, would draw on evidence, right? They rely um, on unusually happenings in the world as evidence of truth. For example, miracles, right? Um, resurrection, which is uh, by far a great miracle as well. Um, the best example that I can think of of an evidentialist is this guy Lee Strobel. He was a journalist and an atheist. And so as an atheist, um, his wife uh, was surging and she came upon this Christian group who seems to be quite serious about their belief. And therefore Lee Strobel uh, set out on a mission to disprove uh, Christianity. And he chose the resurrection as his subject. Uh, but eventually, in trying to disprove the resurrection, he became a Christian. And he wrote uh, several uh, best-selling books, including The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith. And they are available. And even Lee Strobel, you can uh, listen to him on YouTube. He's now um, a kind of an evangelist, missionary who goes around to talk to atheists, to skeptics, to secularists about why we should believe um, the Christian worldview. But he became a Christian through the evidence, considering the evidence for himself. And I'm sure there are other stories like his story, but he is one of the latest stories <coughs> of those who became Christian simply by considering the evidence uh, about Jesus' resurrection from the New Testament and from other historical um, sources. So, but usually the way uh, Christians go about um, showing the evidence that they would uh, marshal historical evidence of the existence of Jesus and even of his claims to divinity from the Bible. But on the other hand, usually the atheist or the skeptic will claim that science has also given the evidence that there is no God. So what can we say about that? Well, I'll, I'll show you a little bit later on what to say. But, um, but you know, I, I just wanted to be aware that even if you present the evidence about Jesus, about the resurrection, the historical evidence that there is, um, usually the skeptic and the atheist would always say, well, science has disproven God. And next week, that will be the topic that we will look at, but I will say something a little later about how to answer that. But, you know, of course, how, how can that be? Uh, how, can, how can science disprove uh, God, uh, given that the scientific method is so focused on putting chemicals in a, in a test tube? And heating it or shaking it. So does that mean that, you know, when people say that, that that science has disproven God, does that mean that they've put God in a test tube and given it? So it's a bit, it's a bit weird to make that claim that science itself, because the scientific method is not set out to prove or disprove the existence of a metaphysical. You know, a metaphysical simply means a um, something beyond the physical right 
Science is not set out to prove or disprove the existence of a metaphysical being like God or even the spirit. The second way is the way of the classical method of apologetics. And um, this way, this is the classical method of doing apologetics in the church. And you can still see this today. There are a num number of apologists. You know, apologists are the people whose life work um, is to give an explanation of our faith. Um, so they would begin by employing natural theology. Now, natural theology, um, of course, in an, a, an example of natural theology in the Bible, you know, in Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, where Paul says that um, God's attributes, invisible qualities, are shown by nature. That is, nature is, you know, when you look at nature, for example, when you look at the sun rising and setting, um, you know, regularly on a daily basis, the Bible says that reveals the invisible quality of God. Of course, we cannot tell what quality the sunrise and sunset reveals about God. We need the Bible to explain to us that, that means his faithfulness, his truthfulness, that he's faithful to his creation and so forth. But anyway, that's natural theology. Natural theology is trying to read God out of nature. So... The classical method of the of apologetics is to draw on natural theology in order to prove the existence of God as the correct worldview. I think we saw some of this last week. Some of the natural ways, like for example, the Big Bang theory, um, the fine tuning of the universe. I would suggest that you would go back. That you should go back to the uh, the last lecture. Uh, to find out a little bit more about those but anyway so natural theology um theologian would draw on nature in order to prove the existence of god uh, and to confirm that that's the correct world so the idea of you know the designer behind the design that is everything created uh you know in our experience if there is a garden somewhere it presupposes a gardener. If there is a design, it presupposes the existence of a designer. If there is a portrait or in a, a great piece of, of artwork, it presupposes the existence of an artist behind it, or even the ultimate cause behind the material world. So if there is, I mean, we saw last week that that's one of the arguments today uh, against um, the existence of God, um, People are saying that if the material world has a cause, that is, you know, there was something that caused the material world to be, and, you know, we want to argue that that ultimate cause is God. But the atheist would say, look, you know, but who, um, who created God? Right? We saw that last week, and we saw that that's called, in the Bible, it's called idolatry. You know, created God in the Bible is called um, idolatry to be God you'd have to exist from eternity to eternity so usually the atheist or skeptic would say even if there is a designer or an artist or even the ultimate cause it cannot be the God of the Bible which of course is true as we saw last week the God of nature is an impersonal designer or artist whereas the God of the Bible is personal and that means we can uh, relate to him. We can hear him speaking to us in his word through the Bible. We can speak to him. He can listen to us. So he's a personal God, right? Therefore, the God, um, the, the God of nature uh, is, of course, you know, it's an impersonal force. Sometimes like the Star War, may the force be with you. That's an impersonal force. That's usually the God that these naturalists want to prove or disprove. But of course, as a true believer, uh, as a true believer, I'm always happiest when the atheist disproves the existence of the natural cause God of their own device. See, because if the God of the atheist or the philosopher 
is an impersonal force or some impersonal designer behind the design. It's not my God. That's not the God of the Bible. So I'm really happy for them to disprove it because their God exists in their minds, as we saw last week. The third way is the way of the cumulative case apologetics. The word cumulative means simply uh, adding up. So it means that uh, it's not just one evidence that can prove the truth of the Christian worldview and of the Christian God, but by the accumulation or the added together of several evidence, it includes the existence of nature, of the, of the cosmos. Cosmos, the word cosmos simply means the universe. The, the word cosmos uh, is a Greek word and, and it has been anglicized, but it simply means cosmos is the world, the universe, all there is. So accumulation apologetics would say there are several evidence that points to that points to the existence of God, and it includes this: the existence of nature and of the cosmos, the reality of religious experience. See, even the atheist, even the non-believers. A lot of them would say they have some kind of spiritual religious experience. The objectivity of morality, that is, objectivity of morality means that morality is something that seems to be imposed upon us. That morality is the sense there's something right, sense something wrong. That's the objectivity of morality. That there's this morality that seems to be a, a sense of that something is right seems to be something that we are all convinced of. See, it's right to protect uh, human life, for example. That's the objectivity of morality. And certain historical facts, like the fact of Jesus and his resurrection, so this will accumulate, and right? all this ev uh, evidence would accumulate according to the cumulative case of all gen and um, also, I would include building personal friendship with the skeptic or the atheist. Uh, I would say more of that later on. But see, the, the, this way of doing apologetic would say there is no one method. You've got to draw on all these kinds of evidence in order to prove that there is a God and, that, and that's the Christian God. But of course, usually the atheists and the skeptics have a negative view of Christians and the church. So even if you bring in all this, this evidence, they would usually say, that, uh, you know, we Christians, we are bad people. There are a lot of bad stuff that the church has done over the course of history. You may have heard of the Catholic Church here in Sydney. Uh, you know, even the Catholic Archbishop, the former Archbishop, uh, went to jail. Uh, for abusing little children. So things, cases like that, are taken by the atheists and the skeptics just to, you know, to say that uh, you know the the Christian worldview is not good. But of course, you know, you need to distinguish between the the fact that Christians are bad people and the fact that God is good. Right? God is always good. It's just us, the people in the church, who become bad by doing bad things. So a cumulative, uh, cumulative apologetics helps to unpack some of these misunderstandings. That is, you may want to explain uh, to the atheist uh, or, the, um, or the skeptic that um, the fact that, you know, there was a book written some times ago God called that, um, it's called uh, God is Not So Good, um, written by an atheist who had died uh, passed away now he knows better now but um but i heard some of the debate that you know that um emerged from the title of the book and some of the christian apologists were trying to say look you know the book should be named christians not so good because god is always good so the argument of the book is that the religious people do a lot of bad things so they include christians they include muslims and other uh, religious groups doing all kinds of bad things all over the world and the argument against the atheist is that look you know that 
religious people do bad things does not prove that the God of religions is bad. Uh, it may be a wrong understanding of you know, their sacred writings, or it may be a different way of interpreting the sacred writings, but it doesn't make the God of religion um, necessarily a bad God. Um, the next way of uh, apologetic is the way of the presuppositional method. So these are heavy words, right? Presupposition. Presupposition is um, the uh, pre means before. Supposition means thinking. So you're thinking before. It's a kind of thinking before that goes. So all of us, we bring a kind of thinking before into this, um, to this class. Or even when you come to a discussion uh, of, of issues with an atheist, the atheists have some pre-thinking about his or her viewpoint, and you have a pre-thinking about your Christian viewpoint, right? That's what presuppositional, uh, presupposition, presuppositional means. So the way of the presuppositional method of apologetics is to draw on that, to draw on, to look into the kind of pre-thinking that the atheist would bring into the discussion with people like you and I who are so convinced of the Christian world. <clears throat> that is, we need to point out to the atheist and the skeptics that the only way in which they can disprove God is to presuppose that there is a God, a personal God who gives truth and makes sense of reason. We saw that last week too. Um, but that's presuppositional method of apologetics. That is, we point out to them, look, you, 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 the way you um, um, program to think there is no God, you know, is that the, ratio, the, the rational way of thinking comes from the presupposition that there is a personal God who gives truth and makes sense of reason that, that I believe, that we believe in the Christian worldview. Or we can say, if there is no God, then what is the value even of proving he's not there? See, if there is no God, full stop. There shouldn't be any more discussions. Why, is, why does the atheist see a value in trying to prove that there is no God? So I, I, I don't see any meaning or any value in doing that if there is no God, right? Even the atheist should be reduced to silence because communication and meaning comes from the presupposition that the God of the Bible is a personal God, a God who is truthful, who makes, who give us um, a sense of reasoning uh, and, and communication. So, <clears throat> Tim Keller uh, points out that uh, atheists and skeptics argue for the dignity of human life uh, and they can only do so they can only argue for the dignity of human life um, if, God, if the God of the Bible is true. This is from his book, um, The Reason for God. And I hope you, I think I saw a lot of you got, gotten the, a copy of the book. But that's his point. His point is that um, we don't need to prove to the atheists and the skeptics that there is a God. Because they always come to a discussion with us from the point of view that there is a God. Because you know, if you ask them that, you know, you ask the dignity of human life, you know, that there is a specific value and significance of human life, almost all the skeptics and the atheists, they believe in that. They believe that we humans are far more in significant and important than the animals, even though they would say that we come from the animals. And I don't really understand. Morally, the atheists always assume morality. For example, they would always uh, question why is suffering evil and you know, why is being wealthy good? But you see, if there is no God, then there is no evil. Why is suffering evil? I mean, if you look at the animal world, the lion just killed the deer, right? No complaints from the deer community or the lion community. Um, the, it, it's just simply animal doing the animal thing, right? But uh, see, the, the atheists would always come and ask that, you know, uh, if there is a good God, uh, why, is, uh, why is there suffering? But how does he know that God is good, see? Those kind of value 
comes from the presupposition, the pre-thinking um, that there is a God. So only God can give us the value of good and evil. For if there is no God, there's no good, there's no evil. It, it just is, right? Just nature killing other na natural things, animals killing other animals, the strong killing the weak. That's it. There is no value at all. And that's, see, I think um, what the atheist is really thinking about in terms of morality is what we see happening in the animal world. But if you were to ask them to go live with the animals, I don't think they would do that. Because deep down in them, I think Tim Keller is, is right, that there is a sense that there is right and wrong, there is evil and good. And those valuations, those values, come from the understanding or the pre-thinking or the idea that there is a good God, a personal God, who makes reasonable for us. See, if there is no God, then who says suffering is evil? Who says wealthy is good? As I said before, you can't say that, um, you know, the lion is just too strong for the deer because that's how nature created the lion, see? According to evolution, the lion just become a lion. There's no reason behind him becoming a lion and being stronger than the deer. There is no value in that. It just, just happened to be, it just is. Just that is what it is. You, know, you can't explain it. And you don't expect any protest from the deer, deer community for them being eaten by the lion, right? That's nature. But this doesn't happen here in, in, in real life because we see protest and things like Black Lives Matter and uh, homosexuality and things like that, right? While they come to us from the perspective of saying that there is no God. Now, the last way is the way of the reformed epistemology approach. And I think this is the weakest way of doing uh, apologetic. And it goes like this. This view claims that we can believe many things without evidence. It's almost like the previous one, but it's not really. And they said that um, this is perfectly reasonable. So it would be both, uh, that is, the guys who are drawing on reform of epistemology, where well, we saw the word epistemology last week, it, it simply means the way we know what we know. Epistemology is how we know what we know, right? So I know that there is a God. How do we know that? That's epistemology, right? Trying to explain how we know that there is a God. That's the area of epistemology. So the way of reform a bit of epistemology, they would say, well, you know, you, you don't need evidence to believe anything. You can just believe things. And therefore, these guys would not both are arguing rationally about the truth of Christianity or scriptures, but they do. It, they would simply assume that we already have it. Even the atheists would already have the truth of Christianity or scriptures. Of course, you know, as John Calvin says, we all have a sensus divinitatis, a sense of the divine in ourselves. I mean, it's just John Calvin drawing on Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, God says that, uh, Paul says that God has written his law in our hearts. And therefore, John Calvin, one of the theologians of the 16th century, uh, said that it means that we have a sense of God. Everyone has a sense of God in ourselves, even the atheist. These apologists will argue by asking the unbeliever or the atheist to put themselves in situations where people assume belief in God. So in other words, they would say, they would start by saying, let us assume that the God of the Bible is true. Right? So they want the atheist, they want the skeptic to put their um, minds in that um, category. Let's say that the God of the Bible is true, and then they, because they see their assumption is that these guys have, the, the, even the atheists, they have a sense of God in themselves, and therefore they could understand, um, you know, the argument from um, the point of view that there is a God, and that the God of the Bible is true. But you know, um, if the way we see the atheist is true according to the Bible, um, then they are incapable of conforming to this view. That is, if they are dead in their sins, according to the scriptures, then it's impossible for them to put themselves in the assumption 
that the God of the Bible is true. And you see things from that. There need to be a, an illumination, a, a miracle of the Spirit awakening them so that they can then become, uh, um, they can be able to look at the world and then re at reality from the perspective that the God of the Bible is true. So this is why I say that this is the, this seems to me to be the weakest way of doing apologetics because it assumes uh, something that the atheist and the skeptic um, does not have, right? Or, or need some spiritual awakening or a miracle of God's grace uh, to happen in their lives in order for them to be able then to understand uh, where we're coming from, where we're coming from as Christians with the assumption that God, the God of the Bible is true. So um, here I would um, stop and uh, ask whether there's any questions or comments. So those are the five ways of doing apologetics. Any, any questions, any questions, even questions of clarifications in these five methods? Which one do you think uh, would appeal to you best? Bessie? Yeah, I was just going to ask, so the, the discussion around um, the saying to the atheist, well, you're trying, um, in order for you to disprove the existence of a God, there has to be a God in order for you to disprove it. But if they say, well, the reason why I'm disproving it is because you are telling me that there is a God. So what do you say to that? So it isn't that they are presupposing that there is a God, but that you have said there is a God. So that's why they're saying there is no God. <laughs> well, yeah, even the, um, even the idea that there is no God, they would always begin with the, uh, the assumption that there is a God, isn't it? Uh, is that, that what you're asking? Because, like, when you say there is no God, in a way, you are you are kind of assuming that we have a common understanding of who God is. So, when you say there is no God, you are presupposing that I understand what you mean by by God, right? And so, there's already a common understanding that we usually don't don't see when we are discussing things with the atheist, but that's what happened. It's it's um, it's like saying, um, don't think of a horse, right? Don't think of a horse. Well, I mean, it's 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 <laughs> presupposing that we both know what a horse is, right? And therefore, in order not to think about a horse, you have to think there is a horse, but I don't want to think about it. So it's just the same as God. Uh, there, when you say there is so it's no about the, sorry, Marfo, so it's about the definition of God, hey? like yeah, the definition, yeah. Definition. So there is a so what I basically what I was saying before there is a you have to bear in mind that when you are talking to the atheist, you may not have the same idea about God, right? See, the atheist's idea of God is this God that lives uh, or exists because I'm able to prove it, or I know how to prove him to be. Uh, existing right we know God because of Jesus so there are, those are two uh, totally different ways of viewing God and, and maybe you need to uh, to clarify that first before you continue on the discussion with any skeptics or any atheists that you may come across Josh uh, is Ravi Zacharias an evidentialist yeah, I mean, I, I only, I'm only starting to listen to him um, because I didn't used to listen to him, but when he died, then I found out he was an apologist and I'm starting to listen to him. Uh, it's, it's really hard to tell. But he said that there are four basic questions that apologetics and, and even atheists need to give an answer to. That is, uh, where did we come from? What is the meaning of life? Uh, where are we going? And what does it mean to be human? So four questions, he says that they're the questions you need to ask the atheists to explain to you because you know only the Christian worldview gives a, uh, a coherent and a clear and a reasonable account to those four questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, um, yeah. Uh, but I mean, uh, listening to him, he's, um, he's really good. I think his work is now continuing. You, you heard of um, people are familiar with Ravi Sakharaj? 
he's a, he, he just passed away. Um, he, he, he used to be a Christian apologist, an Indian. He was educated in Cambridge, uh, very fluent in English, very fluent as, uh, in Indian Hindi as well. Um, he wrote several books um, defending the Christian worldview. Although when I listen to him, it's very hard to go from, I mean, he's, he's, he's really good, he's really clear. But, you know, the, for me, the, the thing that I always look for in a, in a speaker is, you know, where is the word of God? How does the word of God come into bear on these ideas that you're bringing to me? Uh, because, but, I mean, he's, he's really good. His work is now continued on by a guy called Kares Nabil, who is the guy who wrote that book, uh, Seeking Allah and Finding Christ. You heard of that? You heard of that book? He, yeah. Uh, yep. I, think yeah. The, I, I, I think Nabil passed away as well. He oh, did. really? Yeah. Cancer, yeah. No, that's my thing. I cancel. Yeah. Wow, okay. So yeah, maybe he's very powerful. Well, very maybe uh, maybe a borochetic is very dangerous for us. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, I, I just I start I, I, I listened to Nabil twice. I didn't know that he's passed away too. Well, wow, that's mm -hmm. sad. But anyway, maybe you guys can become the next Christian apologist, um, you know, speaking on behalf of the Christian viewpoint. Because I mean that's what all Ravi Zagarias, that's all he did. He was invited to give almost the same talk. Uh, different, you know, um, in different places about the existence of God and why the Christian worldview makes more sense than the atheistic worldview. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. Send me your questions if you have any questions, right? Let me go back to sharing my screen. Let's continue the second part of this. Right, so now, so now I want to look at the atheistic and secularist. Now I'm introducing a new term there, the secularist. Well, the term secular is just the same as the term materialist. So the secular, secular is the person who lives just for this world, a person who believes that all there is is matter, is nature. There is nothing beyond nature. There is no spiritual realm. There's no um, supernatural realm. There's no metaphysical or beyond the physical realm that all we have is just what we see. So if you don't see anything like God, well, he's not there. Um, so, so what do their reasoning missed out on? Right? And I believe that um, she did the problem with them is that the atheistic and secularist kind of reasoning missed out on a lot of real life values. See, because if it is true that there is no God, then why still live as if life has values? One of the um, uh, philosophers of the um, 1960s, I believe, uh, Albert Camus, Albert Camus was a French philosopher, but he says, um, you know, if there is no God, the only reasonable thing to do is to kill yourself. At least you are in control of your destiny. If you, are control, you show that you are at least control of something. Because if there is no God, you are not in control because you're just the result of a natural process. You're here because you're here. So the only reasonable thing to do is just, you know, take your own life and um, I think he died naturally, but that's what he said, you know, that's what he, that's his conclusion from living an atheistic, existentially secularist kind of worldview. <clears throat> so if it is true, there is no God, then why still live as if life has values? Why is it so unnatural to treat life as if it is meaningless? You see, even the atheists, even the skeptics, when they are confronted with death, you know, it's, it's the thing that really puts a, um, you know, puts, kind of set them back among themselves, you know. You know, that death seems to be very unnatural. I heard that Steve Jobs, you know, the guy who invented, uh, he was the founder of um, Apple Mac <clears throat> computers. Uh, well, he died of, uh, I think, pancreatic cancer a few years back. But, you know, when he faced 
he came face to face with death. He said, well, it's, it's so unnatural to think that life, uh, that death, you know, life is, will come to an end simply by a click, you know, just click something and it's finished. It's so unnatural for life to be like that. So why is it so unnatural to treat life as if it is meaningless? You know, even the atheist, even some of the skeptics of Christian worldview and theistic worldview, theistic is belief there is a God, theistic worldview, even some of those people who go against it, they, towards the end of their life, when they come near their death, they start to question uh, the foundation of their atheistic, naturalistic belief. Why is it so unnatural to think that we are here and that we die and that is all there is? As I said, like Steve Jobs. So this is Harvard University professor James Wood. He says, how can it be that this world is the result of an accidental Big Bang? How could there be no design, no metaphysical purpose? Can it be that every life, beginning with my own, my husband's, my child, and spreading outward is cosmically irrelevant? See, I think he came face to face with the truth, the reality of being no God. If there is no God, no designer behind the design, no metaphysical, no beyond the physical purpose, um, how, how can we say that our life has some relevance? some purpose there is no relevance because if there is no beyond the physical beyond the natural being if there's no supernatural being then we're just here because we're here <clears throat> if everything must be proven scientifically and rationally then we not only rid ourselves of god but also of values like love hate and meaning you see, because as we saw last week, if as the naturalist, the evolutionist would say that love, hate and meaning, they're just a result of chemical process happening in your brain, that they're not really there. See, but it doesn't make sense because you feel is there. So when you say that you feel that you have love for your wife or your husband, see, the sign, the, the, the naturalistic or the evolutionist would say, well, you have to think again because that's not really a feeling. It's just some chemicals reacting in your brain. So, but let's see, that's what it means. See, if everything must be proven scientifically and rationally, then we have to get rid of God together with all these other values. There's no values, there's no love, no hate, no meaning, just chemical processes. So just make sure you have the right chemicals in your brain. So, but this is not the world the atheist or the secularist live in. I think you, are, you should be able to see that. Even though they say there's no God, but they still get married. They still have faith. You know, I, we, we, Bessie and I saw um, John Lennox and Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins, who wrote that book, um, God Delusion. He's a professor from Oxford and they had a debate and Richard Dawkins was saying, look, I don't have faith. I have reason. And then John Lennox asked him, well, do you have faith in your wife? I think he was shocked by that because he didn't see that even his atheistic reasoning is based on faith. He believed in those things. So things like God, love, hate and meaning still exist in the world, in the thinking, in the presupposition, in the mind of the atheist and the secularist. So natural reasoning is inapplicable to the central values of human life. Things like hope, love, beauty, honor, suffering, and virtue. That is, as we said before, when you look at nature, it's very hard to get to see a, hoping, a, a, a deer who has hope uh, well, he may, the deer may run away from the lion, but there is no hope in him running, uh, in, in the deer running away. See, there's no hope in the animal world. There is no love as we understand it. It's just a natural appetite to reproduce, right? You see that in, the, in, in animals reproducing themselves, there's no love. 
Um, there's no commitment. See, commitment in, a, in terms of a one-to-one -one relationship like marriage, that doesn't exist. So in other words, things like beauty, honor, suffering, virtue, natural reasoning alone is incapable or incapable of explaining those things. The things that are so meaningful to us in our lives, the things that are so uh, important to you and to me in our life, and even to the atheist and the secularist. Atheism and secularism also has no ground for morality. Morality is the sense of that there's some things that are right and some things that are If there is no God, why is there still a sense of right and wrong? As I said before, you know, even asking you and me, even questioning our faith in God, why is that a value? Why we should say, look, why do you, what, what are you getting at in trying to question my faith? If, if you are atheistic and you don't believe in God, what, what do you do? You're trying to evangelize me to be like you, but if you're trying to evangelize me, wait, what, what's the purpose of evangelizing an, as an atheist? Because is there, in, if there is no purpose, why should you try and convince other people that what you believe is true and what they believe is not true? See? Truth and untruth, they are values. They are values that are brought to us by the personal God of the Bible who says, I am the truth, the way, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The reason itself cannot tell us what is true and false. I hope you're able to see that. Right? Reason can just tell us something is reasonable, but it doesn't tell us whether that reasonable thing is true or false. Reason based on nature alone can only lead to the survival of the fittest. And you see that in nature. And in nature, well, a lion eats the deer. Well, it's because that's the natural reasoning. The strong eats the weak. The strong lives on, the weak dies out. That's nature, survival of the fittest. That's, the re that's reason based on nature alone. There's no truth, there is no falsehood. But is morality then a dance to the deer? And it is, this is what Richard Dawkins, the author of The God Delusion, says. There is no morality. We simply dance to the DNA's music. You understand DNA? I hope DNA is the foundational um, element in our body. We all have different DNAs, uh, depending on the combination of those chromosomes. Chromosomes combination Science, scientists are now saying that those combination is a communication, it's a kind of a letter. So every one of us has a, a unique message in our body called the DNA. So these atheists like Richard Dawkins, Professor Richard Dawkins of Oxford, he says, we simply dance to DNA's music. There is no purpose, just the DNA is moving around and we dance and that's, there is no good, there is no evil, it's just a dance, right? It's just that we feel a dance, you know, you're moved by perhaps your, your, your feeling and, and there's nothing else. There, there's no uh, purpose beyond nature, DNA moving in you to you do something. So on genetical basis alone, reason can dictate the killing of those whose genes weakens the human gene pool. So what, what this is basically saying is, in the natural world, uh, the weak dies out, right? Or the weak should be destroyed. So for example, if in the human gene pool, you know, the, all the genes of humanity, of human beings considered, if there is a particular weak, uh, a particular kind of people that has weak genes, uh, say, for example, the Jews, right? This is one of the arguments that Hitler used in the World War, World War II. So the Jews, they have a weak gene. They need to be destroyed because the, um, um, the ultimate race, the German race, they are the, the fittest, they are the ones to survive. So you have genes that spread diseases or crime or immorality to people, and they should destroy it. See, and, and that's what I'm saying is that's the reasoning from nature, genes. 
But you see, the horrors of World War Two, World War Two, as I said, discredited this kind of region. See, the death camps of Auschwitz in Poland. Um, Bessie and I uh, made a trip to that, and it's a memorable trip to Auschwitz, the concentration camp that kills um, six million Jews. So, death camps as such as Auschwitz show that reasoning based on genetic considerations alone is profoundly evil. See, they saw a good reason for killing the Jews because they had a weak gene. You see that? Naturally, that's a natural, that's a purely natural reasoning process. They almost wiped out the whole Jewish um, race from the world, killing six million of, of them. But we, all we can see that from that kind of reasoning is how evil it is. So therefore, reason alone cannot be a moral guide to society. I know that a lot of atheists say, look, you know, do away with God because that's to do with faith. And what they mean by faith is blind faith. But we all know that uh, Christian faith is not blind faith because our faith is based on history. Historical man called uh, jo uh, Jesus of uh, Nazareth or Joshua. Joshua, I was going to say, not John. Joshua, Joshua ben Yosef, Yeshua ben Yosef, that's his name. That's Jesus' name in Galilee, in Nazareth, in the community where he grew up. Um, well, he was a historical person and he died in a historical time and he was uh, raised from the dead in a historical time. So therefore, our faith as Christians um, are not based on blind faith. It's based on reasoning. So but these guys say, do away with God. Let's just consider reason alone as the guide for our lives. But this is what I'm saying. Reason alone cannot be a moral guide to society because if we use the natural presupposition or the natural idea, idea of survival of the fittiest, it's cruel. Not only that, but uh, secularism and atheism has no real ground for morality. That's what I think you are able to see. The atheistic philosopher, David Hume, he was a Scottish philosopher who lived uh, during Captain Cook's time. In 1773, 1777, Captain Cook came to Tonga. David Hume was still uh, alive in 17... Uh, well, he died in 1776. But he said, you cannot move from east to ought. What does that mean? Well, if something is here, it doesn't tell you what to do with it. See, that we are here, we are here in the world, does not tell us what we must do or how we must live. Right? East cannot move from east to ought. Or if I say a kettle is boiling, well, it simply means the kettle is boiling. Right? There is a boiling kettle in the kitchen. There is a kettle boiling. Right? reasoning does not tell us that we should have a cup of tea because the kettle is boiling. Do you see the point? You cannot move from is to ought, right? The kettle is boiling. We must have a cup of tea. It doesn't make sense according to natural, naturalistic kind of thinking. We hear simply, simply means that we hear. We hear because we hear, because we hear, because we hear. That's all there is. It does not tell us we ought to do something or we ought to be moral. That's what I'm saying. That's, that's what this guy was saying. He was an atheist. We hear, it doesn't, it doesn't mean we should be moral. We hear means we just hear. Or that we must live in a certain way. So why matters matter if there is no God? See, if there is no transcendent being beyond nature, if there is no God, if there is no Christian God, then who says that we ought to do something? Who says? Who says that black lives matter? Well, if, if its founders are Marxist secularists, Marxism, Marxist, Marxism ideology is the foundation um, ideology in communism, uh, and in communism, there is no God. So who says that black lives matter 
if its founders are Marxist secularists who believe that all there is is just matter. If we are simply here as a result of an accident of nature, why make one race of humanity, namely plagues, matter? Who says that the plague lives matter? Who says that? If there is no God, if there is no transcendent being beyond nature, if all there is is just you and me and this Marxist secularist, why should we say that the black lives matter? Who says that? Why not say that blacks are weak and are therefore subject to be wiped out by natural processes of survival? Because that's the outcome of pure naturalistic evolutionistic kind of thinking the weak are killed off and wiped out by the strong why why should why why just say that you know, why, why not say that the plex are just a weak gene sort of people and they eventually will be wiped out why 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 do they matter it says it is racism to kill a black person or any person that is if there is no god if all there is is matter, why does it matter that a black person is killed or any person for that matter? And why, why is racism something to worry about if we're just animals just purely here by accidental processes of nature? We're just here because we're here. Why should we put particular significance into certain race like the black race? So in atheistic morality, you know, the Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky, who lived in the 19th century, 1821 to 1881, he says, if there is no God, everything is permissible. See, this is, you should point this out to the atheist. If there is no God, well, you should permit me to be a Christian. You shouldn't question my faith. You know, everything's permissible. You can be an atheist. I'm a Christian. What's, what's the problem, mate? Right? Everything is permissible if there is no God. No one can say it is wrong to kill blacks or it is wrong to kill. If there is no God, who would say that something is wrong? By what basis of authority should we think that blacks or life really matter? Who says? Who says? Right? In the natural world, the strong simply kill off the weak, as I say, and as you would observe, you see, this is what we call empirical reasoning. Empirical is what we experience. In our experience of nature, the strong simply kill off the weak. No other species in the animal world would protest that the lion has no right to kill a deer. You see that? But why do we humans think that there's crown to protest the killing of a black man? If it's just an accident of nature that the black man was killed, who has the right to say that that black man has a right or as a human being? And why do we think that human beings have more right than the deer? We're all animals. We're all result of natural processes. Do you see the unfairness, the injustice in the kind of thinking that the atheist and the naturalistic uh, people come with to our discussion and which sometimes we don't we're not able to see that right because we're always arguing from the idea from the presupposition of being christian and that they too think like we do they reason like we reason but they shouldn't because they are atheists and secularists so it seems that even the atheists and skeptics in order to continue to be what they are that is in order to continue to be atheists and skeptics they must assume the Christian or religious worldview in order to live. That's the only way they would live. They, they have to assume that Christian religious worldview is true, that there is a personal God who can communicate, and therefore we can communicate because we were made in his image, that there is a personal God who created us in his image, and therefore we are more important than animals. We were not made to be animals. We were made different from the animals. We were created in the nature of the Trinitarian God, the community of God that we saw last week, whose characters should be characters 
in, in that community, the Trinitarian community, should be embodied in the way we relate to one another. They are selfless in that community, in that Trinitarian community. We must be selfless too. That's what that's how life should be lived, should be lived as the image of the Trinitarian God. So what of the atheistic worldview? It seems to me that it is indeed self-contradictory. And this is something that you need to um, bear in mind every time you meet an atheist. You, you know, self, see, it's self-contradictory because if there is no God, you should ask them, do you think something is wrong in the world? Because wrong and right, they are, you know, theistic values. They are values that, uh, that you know, came to us because of our belief in God. So self because if, it's, um, if they are self-contradictory, you should ask them that. Do you believe something is totally wrong um, in this world? Because, you know, um, they will tell you that they do believe something is wrong with the world. But if there is no God, there is no value for human beings. There is no significance for us. There is no rights of humans over other humans or other animals. There is no morality, no right, and no wrong. And therefore, as I said before, uh, why is it wrong then to believe in God. See, the, 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 the first basis of the atheist coming to ask us about evidence, you know, evidence for our faith in God, the basis of their question is that they must be assuming that it is wrong to be a Christian, that it is wrong to believe there is a God when they themselves, according to their own thinking and reasoning, they have found out that there is no God. So they must come from the presupposition that to believe in God is wrong, but wrong and right, that's inconsistent with their own viewpoint, their own worldview. But even to argue there is no God, there's no intrinsic value. Do you see what I'm saying? Intrinsic value, a value in its own. So to say that there is no God, so, so what? If there is no God, so what? See, that's what we should say to them. Um, because if there's no God, there shouldn't be any argument. He shouldn't, he shouldn't make it a big thing because no God, no values, nothing. There is no reasoning. Then we shouldn't listen to him or her about even arguing that there is no God. So how do we deal with the atheist firsthand? To ask the atheist, what is his evidence? What are his, his or her evidence for the non-existence of God? Usually when I ask the atheist, they say, ah, oh, because we don't see God. So does that mean that if we don't see anything, that it doesn't exist? So things like love, as we saw before, like, you know, values like uh, being excited about something, values like hope. These values are so significant, so fundamental for human life. If we don't see those things, does that mean they don't exist? Well, of course, they would say they don't exist. They're just chemical reactions in your brain. But you need to kind of ask them, you know, what is their evidence? What are their evidence for believing there is no good? How do you know that there is no good? That's our question to them. You should kindly and, you know, um, respectfully ask the atheist, how do you know there is no good? <coughs> if science, <coughs> this is what I said before, if science has disproven the existence of God, and then did they put God in a test tube? Because, I mean, you go to a scientific lab, that's what they do, isn't it? I used to study chemistry in the University of New South Wales here in Sydney. My major, it was chemistry. And that's what all we did. All we did was to mix some chemicals to produce something and then to write some report of uh, this particular thing under this particular condition, we are going to produce this. So this experiment under this particular condition, it will produce this particular compound. And then you send that result, that little explanation to some other lab overseas, and they are bound to reproduce the result that I got here. That's all that science do. You know, it's all based on seeing something, putting in a test tube, testing it, and then saying, look, you know, if all the other scientists in the scientific community is able to do the same experiment and produce the same result, then it's true. It becomes scientific truth. But what about God? 
what kind of experiment did they use to produce or disproduce God, so to speak, or prove or disprove God? See, sometimes, you know, we are caught out of hand when they say science has disproven God. And as I've heard people throwing this around as if this is a statement uh, of universal truth. But we need to think again about the claims that science, and we will see that next week. We will look in, into uh, the argument that science has disproven God, whether we can give something into it. But this is, this is uh, um, by way of introducing so, um, well, let me stop there before I go into the last part of our lecture tonight and see if there's any comments already. Um, you're still awake? You, uh... <laughs> Sorry, Mark, but just a question on your last point about science has disproven God. Then what do they mean about disproving God if, if they even put God in a test tube? <laughs> what do they mean? <laughs> Well, I don't know what they mean, but yeah, so, so, I mean, this should be what they mean, right? But I don't think that's what they mean. I think what they mean is basically about evolution. But you see, evolution is not science, right? Anyone who studies science would know that evolution is based on some kind of historical approximation that, you know, this one set of species evolved to become that's another. Yeah, it's a theory. It's that's right. Not that's right. It's not uh, well, but of course, in the scientific world, they would say uh, that's good enough for reason. You know how we heard um, it's an accepted theory, not yeah. a proven theory. So that's right. But in the uh, well, in the in the world of the atheist, that's almost the for them that's the ultimate proof of the non-existence of God because of evolution theory. That's right. It's a theory. It's not. Anything else? Any other comments on that? Josh, you're right. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I watched that case for Christ movie, and I just remember Lee Strobel uh, at the end when he's about to like come to faith. He's like, it takes more faith for me to maintain my atheism. Yeah. Than God. yeah so, it is true. Yeah. It is yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. It's the same very well, uh, Josh, even um, when I listen to those liberals who say that, that Abraham did not exist and, uh, you know, the Genesis account of creation is not, um, is not really true. Uh, it, I said to them, look, you know, it requires me more faith to believe what you believe than to believe what I believe. You know, what I believe is it's easier to say that there is a God who is very powerful and who is able to do what I cannot do. Um, rather than you, you it requires more faith to say that it didn't happen like that and even to disprove the existence of Abraham. so yeah i mean you're right it's it's um i think lee strobel found that out too you require more faith to be an atheist than to be a, a christian or a theist all right the last part of our uh, of our lecture tonight and he's just looking at for ideas to consider in doing apologetics. So since the denied was meant to be focused basically on ways or approaches to doing apologetics, and we saw those ways uh, in the beginning, I think um, when I look back at them, basically the presuppositional and the evidential um, seems to me to be um, what, what I see uh, most people are using today um, in terms of argument uh, even uh, Professor John Lennox seems to me to be an evidentialist because he always produces evidence and he's, he, but he's really good in that. Uh, so if you have some time, um, you know, watch some of his debates, John Lennox debate with some of the other atheists, especially um, Richard Dawkins. So we should remember when we come to do apologetics, that is to give an explanation. Remember 1 Peter 3.15, 1 Peter, 1 Peter 3.15, let me... Uh, See whether I can get my Bible out and read it to you. Sorry, I, I did think of this, but I, I mean, it, it really bugs me that I haven't referred to the Bible throughout this whole lecture now, it's an hour now. But let me read back, uh, back to one bit of three. So, if you have your Bible with you, um, it'd be good to flip it open to one Peter three, um, fifteen, just to remind ourselves why we're doing what we're doing. And one bit of three um, fifteen says, 
but in your hearts. Let me read from verse 13. So who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. I think sometimes we fear the threat that the atheist or the secularist put through to us that we may be believing in something that has been disproven. So they, 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 they manage to create in us a sense of fear uh, to be threatened by that. But, so this is uh, Peter's answer to that. But in your heart, revere Christ as Lord. And so before we even give an explanation of why we believe what we believe, we really need to ensure that Jesus Christ is our Lord. And we revere him in our hearts as Lord. He is the one who runs our lives. He is the one who um, puts, us, uh, puts his love in our hearts to save us. And therefore, this is why we do apologetics. We don't do it to prove that we are, we are better, uh, we're better in arguing against the atheists. We don't do it to show that we are more rational than them. We don't do it to put them down, you know, to show that their reasoning are so weak. No, we do it out of, out of the love of Christ. We do it because Jesus Christ as Lord wants everyone to be saved. And therefore, this is why it matters to us to do apologetics and to answer the questions of our critics and even of those skeptics, those atheists who um, don't really believe and who want to argue fiercely against us for believing what we believe. So, so Peter says, but in your heart, revere Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So, I mean, if in the end, the atheist would be ashamed of speaking against our faith, uh, saying it's a leap in the dark, or it's saying it's, it's uh, unscientific, or one of those things that they would say, if in the end, we are able to make them ashamed of their slander, to make them found out that, no, we don't, be, we don't, we don't leap in the dark. Faith is not um, an unreasonable jump in our imagination. Uh, faith is based, our faith as Christians is based on historical evidence of a person who came and who died, bro, so Christ. So, um, but do it with a clear conscience. That is, as I said, don't do it out of hatred. Don't do it out of bitterness. Do it out of love and ask the Lord to help you to do it. So we should remember that the universality of sin in all people, right? That is even in the so how can we do apologetics most effectively in the light that all people are blinded by sin? So even our atheistic friends, skeptics, they are blinded by sin. But even us, you see, our knowledge is not um, absolute. It's not perfect, but it's adequate, right? We know enough in order to say that we know Jesus lived as a historical person, that he was raised from the dead. So we know enough, we don't know absolutely, but we know enough in order to be convinced about our convictions, our faith convictions from the Lord. So to what extent can fallen people use their reason to understand the things of the Spirit? So remember that what, when we're talking about God, when we're talking about these values like love, hope, those things, they are things of the Spirit. So biblically speaking, um, what does the Bible say about the atheist, the skeptic, and the secularist? So we need now to bring that into consideration. So what the Bible says about that, right? So Acts thirteen forty eight. So this is where you should get your Bible. You should always be careful not just to keep going like what I did before without any Bible reference, because um, the Bible is the sure foundation of Doing a project. Even if you're defeated in the argument against the atheist, you know, be happy, uh, cheer up, because we know that the Bible is the solid foundation of what we believe, and that's evidence, that's historical evidence. So, Acts 13 48, this is Paul um, preaching in Antioch in Pisidia, 
and he was rejected by the Jews. And then he's, he went out and he said, uh, I read from uh, verse 46 of Acts 13. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. This is the Jews because there was a Jews contingent who came and they managed to kick Paul and Barnabas out of the synagogue, Jewish church. So Paul said, we had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you rejected and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. So we are light to the Gentiles. We are light to the atheists. And you should always remember that. So don't be unloving to them because that will snuff out the light that we want to show with them, to show to them. Right? So we are the light to the Gentiles that to bring salvation will always be our purpose in arguing these people and not to put them down, but to bring salvation to them. So we should pray for them too. And then verse 48, it says, When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed to eternal life believed. See, the fact that only the elect will hear us out and believe. So be patient with unbelievers and pray for them while you are talking to them. See, while you're listening to the atheists you know, going on about his proof or disproof of the existence of God, well, you should pray for them because, you see, only the elect uh, will hear us out. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 2, 14, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. This is, again, talking about the spiritual wisdom that we have because of the spirit being in us. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 2, 14 says, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. Did I share my screen? I can see no, my... I can see it now. Sorry. Sorry about that. I get too excited. This is where I am now. Um, so, remember that when you talk to the atheist, God only saved the elect, but, but, this is a big but, right? We don't know who the elects are, right? You shouldn't make those conclusions after talking to them for 20 years and they're not believing, maybe they're not the elect. No, you shouldn't because, you see, you keep, you keep talking to them, keep being patient with them, keep praying for them because we don't know. And God has a good reason for having us not know about the elect so that we keep being patient with people, we keep sharing the gospel with them. Also, 1 Corinthians 2.14, 1 Corinthians 2.14, you'll be good to have your Bibles open. Uh, and here it says, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. So if your friend, atheistic friend, don't be disappointed that they don't see your argument or they don't understand. You have to remember, right, that the non-believers are unspiritual and it will be hard for them to accept the things that comes only from the Spirit of God. And if we go back to Romans, Romans chapter 3, verses 8 to 10, uh, and this is Paul talking about the universality of sin in human beings, including our atheistic, skeptical, secularist friends. Paul says, um, Romans 3, 8 to 10. Uh, why not say, as some slanderers claim, that we say, let us do evil that good may result. The condemnation is just. But verse 9. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? So he's talking... Paul here is speaking as a Jew. Right? What shall we conclude? Do we Jews have any advantage? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. And if I were to read uh, 11 and 12, there is no one who understands, there is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. So remember that. 
when you're talking to your, your non-believing friend. But also John 6, 44. Uh, John 6, 44. Uh, it says this. And this is Jesus speaking uh, to the Jews. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up at the last day. So there is a sense in which we cannot draw the atheists, the unbelievers to God with our well-rounded argument. We can only draw them to God through the gospel, through Jesus drawing them to himself. And then verse 65, which says, uh, he went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. So it's one thing to argue with them. I'm not saying that you shouldn't argue with, I mean, you shouldn't discuss with them. Argue seems to be a, a stronger kind of word because we do it here at home with Bessie most times. But what I'm saying is discussion. If you want to discussing with, uh, uh, with your atheistic, uh, secular, skeptical friends, it'll be good to remember that only the Father can lead them to believe what we believe. Uh, in John 12, 32, um, John 12, 32, and this verse, you may be familiar with it, it's talking, Jesus talking about the meaning of his resurrection, or of, sorry, of his, of his crucifixion. And he says, um, John 12, 32, he says, um, and I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. As I said, Jesus is the one who would persuade people to come to him. So, and then make sure you know the gospel. See, this is the gospel I teach our children here in our church. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4. So it'll be good to, to teach your kids at home. You know, remember every time we get together with the kids, I teach them this, right? Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. So this is what we believe. This is the gospel. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. So the source of historical evidence for Jesus' death and resurrection comes from the scriptures, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So remember the gospel, because in the end, it's Jesus, it's the gospel that can draw people uh, to believe um, in what we say. But also John 16, remember this, this is about the spirit. Uh, John 16, 8 to 11. And this is Jesus talking about the purpose of the spirit coming to be with us. And he says, when he comes, that is when the spirit comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. So the persuasiveness of our argument, with, of our discussion with the atheistic, skeptic, secularist, would depend very much on the conviction of the spirit. So this is why prayer should become a very important part of our apologetics. So verse, that's what verse, is at verse 8. And then verse 9, about sin, because people do not believe in me, about righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer, and about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So this, only the Spirit of God can convict people of the gospel. Um, um, <clears throat> we must not rely on the persuasiveness of uh, our argument, even though it's good to prepare, right? I'm not saying that we should be unprepared to face um, the atheist um, and the skeptics. We should be prepared. But um, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, so going back to 1 Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2, and this is what he says. Uh, I, I read from verse 1, and so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For, um, 1 Corinthians 2, 2, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So He didn't, he didn't come with um, uh, eloquence, which was, you know, in those days, they used to go to university to study uh, the subject called rhetoric. And rhetoric 
would teach you um, from the basis of a Greek philosopher of the Greek philosopher Aristotle how to um, you know put together an argument in order to persuade people and uh, Paul says he didn't he resolve not to do that because he wanted them he wanted the Corinthian believers to to base their faith on the conviction on the persuasive power of the gospel by the Spirit of God. And I think I read to you um, verse 14 before, um, I'm spiritual. so to persuade people to believe in the, so to persuade, but yeah, so even though we, we don't trust in our own persuasiveness, still we need to persuade people to believe the gospel. And that's 2 Corinthians 5. So 2 Corinthians 5, 11 and 20. Here Paul is talking about persuading people. Uh, 5, 11, since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. See that? To persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. So it should be plain. Our lives should be plain before our atheistic friends. But also verse 20 uh, where he talks about the gospel, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. So this is still 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So there's a sense of persuasiveness going into preaching the gospel to persuade people to believe. So even the Apostle Paul uses reasoning against the unbelievers. So this is one example. He's here in Acts 17. Acts 17, verses 1 to 4. So here we can see an example of Paul using reasoning against the unbelievers. Acts 17, this is in Thessalonica. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and to rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. So he used reasoning to explain and prove the case for Christ, the case for the gospel. But apologetic methods. I believe it is always best when relationship proceeds apologetics. Nothing can replace having a good friendship with unbelievers even if it leads nowhere so um, in in our <clears throat> Bessie and I we've got a, a lot of very uh, Bessie especially got a very a lot of very close non-christian friends they become very good friends and we pray with them and when we are with them you know we ask to pray over the food but it's good to keep non-christian friends pray for them be involved in their life, show them the love of Christ um, in every uh, opportunity. It may be the best way uh, to do apologetics, you know, best way for them to see why we believe what we believe, just the love of Christ coming through uh, from our lives. So caution, I want to caution you not to set yourself a time limit for unbelievers to become convinced. So, you know, some of us, we are very impatient. We say, look, it has been five years now and we're building that relationship and nothing has happened. So be patient. Maybe the sixth year or maybe the tenth year. God, in his grace and his mercy, uh, will work in that person's mind to turn them to Christ. So um, also, you've got to be aware of the non-believers' preconception of us, right? Before you talk to them, they already had some ideas of us that Christians are self-righteous, we are mean, we are judgmental, we are ignorant, and are boring. 
a lot of the, a lot of non-believers are just put off by thinking that it's going to be boring facing this believer. Therefore, they put off before they start the conversation with us. It's usually this kind of uh, mentality or preconception. Uh, it's usually based on past experience of un of the unbeliever. There is past experience of believers by the unbeliever. Like what I said before, they may have heard of the Roman Catholic Church abusing children, and therefore they say, look, you know, I told you that these people are mean. They are you know, self-righteous. They probably have heard us Christians, you know, saying that we have, um, you know, confidence that we go to heaven and as if everyone else are going to hell, uh, which is, of course, true. But the way we put ourselves forward seems to them that we are saying we're better than them rather than saying, look, we are no different than from you. We are all sinners. The only difference is that the grace of Jesus um, is in me and I want to to share this, to experience what I'm experiencing through the grace of Christ, through the love of Christ. But be clear that you're aware of this um, preconception before you present the gospel. And it, to avoid showing ourselves to be theologians, because it would intimidate the listener. I always make this mistake, and I'm always regretful of it. You know, coming across as the scholar or the theologian, uh, using the authority, that kind of authority, um, but yeah, in the in the end, end up winning the battle but losing the fight uh, because you lose the um, you lose the soul of that person who feels belittled, feel that um, I put them down. I've come across to be the scholar and to show that they're not. So I, I, I do regret that, the times when those things are happening. The relationship apologetics seems to me is the best approach. Relationship where you build friendship with the non-believer, you pray for them, you get involved in their life. You, you know, a lot of the, the things that people are looking for, they're looking for love, real love. When we were in, in um, uh, when we came back from my um, PhD and we lived in a community uh, of Bible um, college students, we felt that these people were only interested in building a relationship if it leads to some long-term relationship, ministerial relationship, or if it leads to some benefit for them. And uh, because we were only there to study and we were going back to Tonga, uh, it, se it seemed to us that they didn't think it was worthwhile building a relationship with us because they wouldn't benefit from anything from us because we'd be leaving the country. So it was really sad for us, but it was a very lonely time and we finished. But what I'm saying is, I believe that when Christians lose that kind of love, the love for one another, um, we will argue, we can argue with any, any, the non-believers uh, till the cows come home. Uh, I don't think we can be convincing to them. Uh, we need to come to them with the love of Christ in our hearts. Um, I think it's here, yeah, and of course, you know, praying for the skeptics, there has no substitute. Lord, we thank you so much that uh, you've shown us these things. Just want to commit ourselves to you in prayer and ask Lord that you help us to be patient with those relationship, um, especially with non-believers, our cousins, our friends who are atheistic. I pray Lord that we will not always come across to them as judgmental and self-righteous, but help us to show them such love for their souls, such genuine love. And patience, just as you have loved us and laid down your life for us, I pray that we, we too will lay down our lives for these friends, these relatives, these cousins of ours who lost their faith and pray for them and keep befriending them, even if these people show no interest in us. I pray, Lord, that you will please give us the grace continue to build up those relationships. So we pray that the wisdom that we have acquired 
through tonight from your word and from the wisdom of people of this world and the wisdom of just reflecting on how the atheist, the naturalist, the skeptic, the secularist think. Please help us, Lord, to be better equipped for communicating the gospel of Christ to them in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll stop sharing there and I'll come back and uh, see whether there are any comments or questions. So we've got 25 minutes, comments, questions, just chatting. Yeah, sorry, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, the last, uh, the last slide you were talking about, uh, not to be boring. <laughs> I, 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 I see that, and then we start adapting all the worldly things. Yep. And we make excuses. Trying to entertain people, eh? Yes. Yeah, I think we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't do that. <laughs> I think what basically people are saying that we are boring because sometimes because of our insecurity, we end up talking um, endlessly about ourselves. But we should, when we come to a discussion with people, even when we are in a group, uh, we, we should think about asking them questions. Rather than talking about ourselves, it's best to think of asking people questions, getting people to talk about the most interesting subject to them, namely themselves, right? Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah, I get your point, Lopetti. I'm not um, an entertainer myself. I don't do cute. Uh, I think it's a waste of time. We're dying soon. Life's too short for that. Um, True. I do serious Bible-believing teaching. And um, yes, people fall asleep. But uh, even the Apostle Paul taught, long into the night that Eutychus fell asleep and so fell down and died. So, I mean, I pray that people in my congregation won't fall down and die because I <laughs> don't think I'd be able to, <laughs> to rescue them. Bessie? Uh, I was just going to say, I, I don't think, I think the boring bit, Lopetti, is about th their perception of our lives, but that's because they don't know us. I just find so I have a lot of non-Christian friends just because I work with like all of them are non-Christians. <laughs> it's really yeah. hard when I come across a Christian person. I mean, not hard, but it's rare sometimes to come across a Christian person. But I just share of my life and who I am. Um, and if like I don't push the Bible, like I don't have every second word that comes out of my mouth has to be the Bible. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, it, does, it doesn't have to be about Jesus. I talk to them about all sorts of things. I think sometimes we, we feel guilty if we're not sharing the Bible or if we're not, you know, talking to them about something and you just feel like every single conversation has to lead to Jesus. But I think that's when we, we work on our own um, that's when you are doing the evangelism and not Jesus. So you can just share of your life and if there's an opportunity to share about the gospel, you do it. But if you don't, then it's okay. I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned in my life is that I'm just comfortable with just letting it be and then talking to them. And if there's things I don't know, I just say, if, if eventually they ask me certain things, then I just say, well, I don't know, maybe I can find out about you. I think that the biggest thing is to actually get them to a point where they can ask more questions. You know, it's not about winning them at that point. It's getting them to think again about where they're at and why they got there. And is there something more that they need to find out? I also want to just share my for like, I come from an, a non-Christian background. So my father wasn't a Christian until like two years before he died. I had a Christian upbringing, but very nominal. So uh, there were many times I just felt like, I think for 20 years, I prayed for my dad. And it wasn't until two years before he passed away. So I was just grateful that he actually did become a Christian. But I just think it's, there were times where I'm just like, Lord, you know what I want. So here it is. And so what? <laughs> I, just, I just always just give up. So I just think like we have non-Christian families and things like that, um, that we love dearly, but there's no way that they're going to listen to us or what we tell them. 
So, yeah, especially our parents, you know. Yeah. Especially your parents. I mean, I I made the mistake of evangelizing my parents, and um, after a while, I I noticed, and uh, with some of my friends, uh, then you know, advising me against it, and I realized that our we can never be uh, the evangelist for our parents. We can always pray for them. And we, I think for them, the greatest testimony is just the way we live. If they can be convinced of the way we live, our Christian faith, that will be the best way to evangelize them. And I think, uh, I, mean, I think maybe probably that's what happened to Bessie's uh, dad. Yeah, I mean, I, been, we've been praying for him, but um, a few days before he died, he professed to us that he believed in the Lord Jesus. But then he said to me, you know, Marfo, I, I just don't understand the Bible. I tried reading it, but I don't understand it. But I know that I believe in Jesus. And so that's enough. That's just enough to believe in Jesus. Yeah. What about Miliana? Yeah. Yeah. Busy? Yeah. Well, with Bessie's non-Christian friends, I enjoy being with them. Uh, I pray for them. I lay hands on their little kids and bless them. And, I mean, I, I always do. I always show them that as Christian, and they're, and they're very accepting of it. Sometimes we tend to hesitate from praying and doing things with non-Christians because we believe that they may not uh, accept it. But there's a sense in which they know that, like what John Calvin said, that there's a sense of God in their hearts. Maybe we can use it to say, look, how about I pray for you? And then you say a prayer. Um, yeah. Mariana, are you okay? Oh, yeah. Um, the, Desa, do you who want to Hello, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, my four. I'm just interested in, um, like, because cause you were saying that you've grown up uh, your whole life, uh, you know, um, in church and stuff. Yeah. But you were an atheist. Because um, I, I tend to get that a lot with my friends um, and cousins as well, who, like, yep. who has been growing up in the church and like they know they pretty much know all the stories and stuff and mm -hmm. so they they tend to use that as arguments against you know um those who have changed and given their lives to christ um what, what's your advice of um things to say like when they say oh yeah i know i know, I, I know the story of this and that mm. and, um, they, like this they, they almost use it as a defense to try and um debunk you know what i mean yeah. Yep, yep. Well, deep down in their hearts, it's um, they because the, the the Christianity that they were exposed to did not make sense to them. So they may know the stories, but they don't see. So that kind of Christianity didn't help them to see the relevance of those stories into their lives. And I believe that this is the effect of. Um, Usually two things. The firstly, um, you know, the Tongan, our parents, they want to do things in Tongan. And they want to make the church a place where Tongan culture is preserved, which is not, I mean, the church is a place where the gospel is preserved. So, but because they make it a cultural center, and therefore the, the gospel failed to um, to be relevant simply because the you know the second generation Tongans who grew up here in Sydney they don't understand they don't understand the formal Tongan language used on preaching but secondly I think most of the preaching in the Tongan church is not um, um, with all due respect I don't think it feeds the soul of people it's really about the preacher it's really about preacher feeling good about themselves and feeling, oh, you know, I'm a lay preacher and here, here am I, I'm, I'm preaching and therefore the minister is so good that he gives me an opportunity to preach. But he's got no concern at all to feed the sheep, to edify the church of God. And it's very, very, um, very, very, um, I mean, very disappointing and annoying. And I believe that a lot of that, you know, Villa, I think the, the best uh, way to approach that kind of situation with the, your cousins or relatives, second generation Tongans, is just to pray for them. Just to say, look, you know, I think you know, you know what I'm talking about, but I'll pray for you. 
because I cannot be convincing to you. See, I, I myself, I was just converted by, by finding out that Jesus is the answer to all my questions. So those people may have questions that are unresolved, uh, but uh, maybe they're afraid to ask it. They, um, they make a statement out of it to affirm to themselves their unbelieving status. But I, I, I was very genuine and honest, and, um, and eventually God was merciful. And I saw that Jesus is the answer to all the questions that I had as a skeptic and as an atheist. Um, theoretical atheist. In practice, I was still going to church. I was still doing all churchy things. But uh, in theory, I, was, I didn't really believe in God. Marvel, can, can I just add to that? I also think there are sometimes, I, I don't know, but my perception of Tongans who know about church but don't want to come to church and don't want to hear anything yeah. about church, sometimes they have a particular lifestyle that might, they feel yeah. that if they were to come to church, it yeah. might not make them do that lifestyle anymore. Yeah. <laughs> like if they're drinking or if they're partying. And so they're not willing yet to give up that yes. lifestyle yeah. and so or they're living with someone <laughs> so they're like oh no um you know i know about church and i know what you're saying to me is true but you know i know all those things I and mean, yeah not not for me now yeah i know that people are running away when people when i ask people to come to church and they keep running away i know for sure that they're doing something <laughs> they're doing something and very soon I will find out what that something is. And Bess is right, because they know that if they come to church, their life will be exposed, to be challenged to change. Josh? I was, I was just going to say, this Aussie black at work, he was like, man, Islanders are some of the most religious people on the planet. And I said, yeah, from the outsider <laughs> looking in, they can be perceived as some of the most religious people on the planet. But if you get to the core of... Um, of it all, um, I believe that's not so. Um, but yeah, he was just, he just said it randomly. He's like, man, I was watching the footy the other night and the Penrith boys were like getting on their knees and praying and stuff like that. You know, you Islander people, you Islander people are very religious. I said, <laughs> yeah, it may seem that we, way. But, look. <laughs> but we do. We do have a sense of God, Josh. Like it's not hard for Pacific yeah. Islanders, and and we're very respectful of God, even if we don't believe yeah. ourselves. You know, like I said, this is like my family. Yeah. <laughs> I know they would just respect people who believe in God, but they wouldn't like it wouldn't be something they would think it's for themselves. But I mean, the other thing is, I often feel like saying to them, you know, I like. That how they perceive as Pacific Islanders, but my perception of them as Westerners is they have no purpose in life. Yeah, I think we're cutting out a bit. Yeah, I think you were a cut out, Bessie. But it's okay. I mean, I, I think, yeah, I think um, the evangelization of, if you are to evangelize a, an islander, um, you can't do the two ways to live. Because when I was at uni, we were, we were given this two ways to live track, right? And then at the end, you have to make a choice. Choose Jesus and live forever or choose to reject Jesus and die eternal death. And of course, you know, I said to them, look, if you were to do that in an island, that they would all choose Jesus, right? So, but because they grew up in a very, in a, in a culture that's very open to Christianity. So we should think of a different way of approaching them. So usually when we, Lopetti and I, uh, we used to go and do visitation in Tonga. And because we were presupposing a, a Christian culture, so what we did was to ask people uh, about heaven. Uh, if they were to die tonight, um, whether they are sure that they're going to heaven. And usually Lobetti and I then would say, look, you know, if, if, if God is there in number one and number 10 is the, is the furthest point away from God, so where will you stand? So usually they would say, well, run about five or six. And so we'd say, look, so, so what, what's need to be done? So usually when they talk, what they talk about, they think they're good enough. They think they want God. 
they just kind of not sure because of the sinfulness in our lives. They, they just can't see any way of being one or two or very close to God because of that. So in other words, they, they, they still don't see that what we need is forgiveness. We can't work our way because most islanders who are being exposed to Christianity or any form of religion, they would tend to think, oh, you've got to be good in order to be, in order to get to heaven, you've got to be good. So, well, maybe Dila needs to start talking to them about that, about going to heaven. How can you be sure? Do you know that in Jesus we can be sure? Uh, by the blood of Jesus we can be washed, and therefore we can be certain of going to heaven, because not because we're good people, but because Jesus is good to us. Yep, Josh. What about Muslims? You know, like, um, you know, apologetics uh, in this course, do you reckon um, we get to learn a, a bit about evangelizing Muslims? Because I have a lot of Muslim friends. They, yep. they make yep. nice food. Yep. They always, they, uh, I have a, a Muslim friend who, uh, from work, who keeps inviting me over to his feast at Ramadan. Well, I keep saying no. Because I'm afraid he's trying to, he's trying to, um, <laughs> trying to win me to his love. So I'm like, oh, bad company corrupts good character. <laughs> well, I mean, the, 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 one of the things to do, maybe just to ask him, yes, I'll come to your thing, but maybe you can also come to my, you know, my Christian, maybe you can read the Bible. Because he, in, um, I heard, I only heard, with uh, Muslims, you must love them. So that's the most effective line. And secondly, for them, there must be a dream to confirm to them that what they're believing is not true. So most Muslims who believed in Christianity, they had two or three dreams confirming them. So Jesus, there's a miracle. So Jesus himself is the evangelist that brings Muslims to Christ um, by, you know, by those dreams. But yeah, loving them, maybe asking them, look, you know, yeah, I want to come to your Ramadan feast. But how about this? How about we read the Bible? Maybe we can read Mark's Gospel. Because I, I mean, I'm, I, I, I found out by listening to Nabil, Nabil Qureshi, I found out that they believe everything we believe, but not that Jesus is God. That's the only thing that he, he wasn't, he didn't find, he didn't find in Muslim, in Islam. They said that he's a good man, but yeah. Anyway, I, I saw uh, Deisa wanted to say something, and then Bessie. Deisa. Oh no, I just wanted to say that um I I I think it's so interesting that 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 God has placed us all in this area in Bankstown. It's such a religious uh town, Reli religious Muslims and religious uh Catholics. And I like I made it my thing um not to miss an opportunity to 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 talk about my faith and i always just kind of i'm i'm one of those weird people that sparks up conversation with strangers at the park <laughs> uh, the other mothers because all our kids play wow. together um and i'm i've spoken to a few muslim women um and and i and i always incorporate my testimony um into when i share with them um, and they're always interested and um, and I have prayed with a Muslim woman as well and wow. and they're always willing to listen and they're lovely 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 people Muslim people um, and and also uh, Lebanese and Greek Catholics as well they're all over here um, I always meet them bump into them um, at the park <laughs> and I just want to encourage everybody like though we don't know everything in the Bible, like just share what you know. And um, I, I'm not afraid to share my testimony. Um, and um, I, I'm excited to do this course because I, I want to grow in, um, in my faith um, and, and, and be bold like, like those early believers. Yeah. Good yeah. on you, Desa. We'll keep you, you know, we should keep uh, Desa in our prayers. Um, as an evangelist, maybe God has put you in your heart to be an evangelist. And like, yeah, I, um, 
yeah, I always just like got Holy Spirit, like just give me a word, help me to just say um, or just share what I want to share um, with these women. Yeah, and it, and it comes really natural when you're speaking to them. Wow. And like you said, my author, like do it out of love. Um, mm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, uh, and, and I pray for every time because we walk around our block and the corner over there, uh, there's a coffee shop. You know, the Muslim, they don't drink beer or alcohol. They drink coffee yeah. even at night. So the coffee bar is their bar, is their bar. And every time we walk past it, I pray for them. So I pray for the Muslims here in Australia that they may be different from all the Muslims in the rest of the world. They may integrate into our culture. Just, I mean, there's a, the, the Australians have a good sense of mateship. You know, the mateship. When I first came here, I didn't really understand mateship. But then, you know, I tend to understand that that's how they relate to everyone else. It's like mate. So almost like your family. That's, that's how they, they, that's how they put it. And I've been praying that the Muslims will integrate into the Australian society, uh, you know, to understand that, you know, people around them are not enemies, even if they don't believe in their, in their faith, um, they are friends. And I pray for, I think you're right, Desa, I'm concerned for that, that we are surrounded by Muslims here in Kuneka and Bankstown. So I pray for the Christian schools around here. It'd be good to, to keep that, them in your And, and a lot of, uh, Catholics as well. Yeah. 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 Orthodox. Um, Orthodox, yeah. Yeah. Maronite the, Catholics, yeah. The big uh, Orthodox Chabelle, Saint Chabelle. I yeah. always, always walk around it over there. I, say, I always say to God, Lord, Lord God, you can give them this. Maybe you can give us something like this. You can give us yeah. a church building, a hall. Uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah. There, but, um, there's a, a, a Baptist minister. When I started seeking, I went to this Baptist church in North Rocks. Oh. And and all of the congregants, like ninety percent of the congregation, are converted Muslims. Yeah. Um, his name is John Piper, and he's got the same name as that famous John, John Piper, Piper in America. Oh. Yeah, but he's Aussie. Um, and yeah, they're all, I think, Afghan. But anyway, they were oh. Muslim, and they they're converted. converted. And that's that's uh, yeah, that's his thing, witnessing to Muslim. That John Piper. Yep. He's a Baptist minister, yeah. And we found a Luke's gospel in Arabic in our mailbox once. And I, I keep it up there because it shows to me that there are Christians here who are reaching out to Muslims by translating the gospel of Luke into Arabic. And it is my prayer because they put it in the mailbox. Uh, so it is my prayer that, that, you know, the Muslims around you would just read that. We should believe that even just the word of God can convince uh, people to believe yeah. the gospel. Mm. So yeah, I mean there are ministries going on. So um, yeah, that's that's good to hear that they, uh, they say. Yeah, I'm concerned too, and I hope uh, all of you who are living around this area. Uh, I think um, really Anna is in New Zealand, so <laughs> probably safe in New Zealand, and Lina is in Kamsi. Uh, I don't think there are many Muslims around your area, Lina. Eh? Um, no, I don't, I'm not really sure. Yeah. Most, I think a lot of Catholics. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so there, there are those religious people around here. Our neighbors here, I think they're Orthodox this year. They're Orthodox Le Lebanese or something. There's a lady who came, found out that I'm a pastor and wanted to bring the grandchildren to our Bible study. Hasn't done it. You're mute, you're muted. Yeah, no, um, they're Greek Orthodox. I think they go, their kids go to Saint Chapelle. Oh, she's gonna share. I can't remember the guy's name, Marvel, but I remember he was he used to do run a course in more college on oh, um, Sam Green. Sam Green, Sam he's, Green. he's the guy with the beard, yeah, he's, he's like he just looks beard. Like <laughs> they look like the Muslims, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he went to, he actually lived in um, Iran or something like that. But he was saying the difference between, like for Muslims, it's really important to show them love because yep. the God that they yeah. have is a God of, of yep. anger and wrath. And so that mm. part about understanding you have to do what yep. God says and that kind of stuff, they understand that. Like the lower part of it, the legal side of it, mm. they understand. But it really boggles their mind when it comes to a God that forgives. You know, they find that really hard to. 
Yeah. Well, so we any any other questions? Shall we finish off with prayer? We can just uh, spend some time. It's eight o'clock. Thank you very much for coming. We we'll just spend some time praying for these things that we uh, you know, pray for the Muslims. Pray that we'll be effective evangelists of our relatives. I now notice yes. that maybe maybe oh. we're just talking too much about the atheists, but we need to know about how to talk to Muslims and even to Catholics. And our relatives. And our relatives. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> our lost Tongan relatives who, who, who don't want to hear anything about the Tongan church. Because that's, I mean, that to me, it's very sad. I've, talk, I've spoken to a number of Tongans, your generation, uh, Dila and uh, Daisa and, and, and Chia, and they just don't want to have anything to do with a Tongan church. So when I mention I'm a pastor of a Tongan church, just put them off because they just think that every Tongan church is just the same. It's all about church buildings, all about money, it's all about yeah, nothing spiritual. So, but it's really sad. So we need, yes, we need to pray for second generation, third generation Tongans here in, in Sydney, that they will come back. They know the story. So they are biblically literate. Uh, they just need to hear the meaning of the story and see the relevance of that to their lives. So please, let's, let's spend some time to pray. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. 